Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2018 Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrol Museum and its Cooperating Society are proud to present Dr. Christopher Jazz. Chris is a curator of quaternary paleontology at the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton. Chris is originally from Western South Dakota. He got his start in paleontology courtesy of an uncle who took him prospecting in the Pier Shale of South Dakota in search of Cretaceous ammonites. He obtained his bachelor's degree from the Black Hills State University in Spearfish, South Dakota. Chris then moved to Flagstaff, Arizona to pursue his master's degree in quaternary studies at the Northern Arizona University. For his thesis, he studied a late quaternary cave fauna from the Black Mountains in Arizona. Subsequently, he moved to the University of Texas at Austin to pursue a PhD in geological sciences. For his dissertation, he studied fossils excavated from Pleistocene cave deposits in eastern Nevada. After receiving his PhD, Chris worked as a scientific associate at the Vertebrate Paleontology Lab Texas Memorial Museum for six months before joining the curatorial ranks at the Royal Alberta Museum. Chris's research interests include cave paleontology, quaternary paleoecology, and mammalian biochronology and biogeography. His current fieldwork ranges across Western North America, including cave and open air localities here in Alberta, Nevada, and South Dakota. For the past few years, Chris has been busy packing and moving his fossil collections and developing new exhibits about Alberta Ice Age fossils for the new Royal Alberta Museum, which is scheduled to reopen at its new location in downtown Alberta this fall. Today, Chris takes time away from his busy schedule to come present to us an overview of his research on Ice Age fossils recovered from cave deposits. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Chris Jazz. Thanks for talking. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to the, the Tyrrell and to Francois for inviting me down to talk. I see you guys had a lot of Ice Age talks this season, so I'm happy to continue that tradition, and I hope it, I hope it uh, persists. Before I get started, uh, I want to point out that a lot, of the, a lot of the content of the talk today is derived from research projects that I'm working on in collaboration with other folks. These are not projects that are solely driven by me, and I think it's always important to acknowledge the, some of the collaborations. So I've got uh, collaborators at a variety, from a variety of places, uh, University of Texas, Parks Canada, the Mammoth Site in South Dakota, and a number of other institutions. And they've all contributed to the, the projects that I'm talking about today. Some of them, some of these projects I'm leading, some of the projects they're leading. And so you will hear me refer to we a lot as, uh, as I'm talking about the, the content today. Also, uh, I tend to like these presentations to be a bit more informal. I'm fine if you guys have questions as, as I'm going along, please, please feel free to ask as, as I go along with the talk today. So why caves? When you can go to places like the Chinle Desert in Arizona and look for phytosaurs, or you can go to deposits that have 60 mammoths in South Dakota, why do you want to go crawl around a, a dark, dusty cave looking for fossils? We all know that caves are incredibly scary places where golems reside, so they're, you know, they're, they can be a bit nerve-wracking. But in reality, they are really treasure troves of Ice Age information. And I've had the good fortune of spending a good part of the last 20 years exploring caves around Western North America with some of my colleagues in search of Ice Age fossils and answers to questions about the Ice Age. Caves are significant for Ice Age paleontologists for a number of reasons. Foremost among them is they tend to be incredibly fossiliferous. Uh, to give you an example, a site that we worked in Nevada, we excavated an area within a cave that was about a meter and a half by a meter and then down to a meter in depth. So a relatively restricted space. In that small space, we pulled out over 30,000 identifiable fossils. 
So you can get a huge sample size from a relatively small area, which is both a good and a bad thing. Good in terms of the science, challenging in terms of actually getting that, that, those specimens broken out to the point where you can actually do some science. You have to put catalog numbers on all those specimens, get them into individual vials. and So there are some logistical cha challenges with that. But caves are fantastic because they do provide great sample sizes for us. They're also interesting in the sense that they sometimes preserve types of fossils that we don't find elsewhere. Uh, the two slides on the bottom are from a site in the Grand Canyon that I had the, some fortune in, in being able to help on a project at. Uh, it's a site called Rampart Cave. The picture to the left, actually let me get the, this out. This picture, uh, you'll see a trench there. That trench is about waist high on me, and it is filled with this stuff, which is the dung of this extinct sloth, Nothrotheriops. So this is a huge dung bed in, in Rampart Cave. It's an amazing sight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, several, several years ago, uh, there was a fire in the cave. The cave is right off the Colorado River at the southern end of the Grand Canyon. And to protect the cave, the National Park Service had put up a fence to keep people from, from going in and out of the cave. But it's still a nice stopping spot for a lot of the river travel. And somebody at some point uh, went up to the cave, couldn't see what was in there, and decided it would be a good idea to throw a lit torch into the cave. So what happens when you throw a lit torch into a cave full of dried out dung? You get a fire. And a lot of the material, as you can see here, is now singed and burnt. But it's still a pretty amazing site with a lot of amazing fossils. Caves are also significant because they quite often have paleoecological data preserved in them outside of the fossils themselves. In the Southwest, and actually even here in Alberta, we find evidence of pack rat middens. So if you're not familiar with pack rats, they're, they're uh, they're small, relatively small rodents, and they love to collect things, hence the, the name pack rats. They go out, they collect bone, they collect plant material, and then they, they poop and they pee all over that material. In the arid southwest, that, that combination of material will then start to dry out, and it actually starts to caramelize. It looks kind of like caramelized candy. But it can that, that caramelized product then contains evidence of what those animals were eating, evidence of plants that were in the area, evidence of animals that were in the area. And in the arid southwest, there are pack rat middens that are over 45,000 years old. So not only are we getting bones out of the cave, but we're getting evidence of the vegetation that was associated with those animals at the same time. We also have speleothems in caves, stalactites and stalagmites that preserve chemical or isotopic records of past climate. And even the sediments themselves give us information. This is from a site in Nevada called Cathedral Cave. And that little unit that I've marked out there is actually a semi-indurated or cemented layer of sediment. And the, we did some mineralogical analysis on that. And the mineral content was indicative of an arid period. So caves are, are great for trying to compile a complete picture of what was going on in a given area at some point in the past. We do try to be very cautious when we work in caves. They are sensitive ecosystems. Uh, at this particular site, we actually laid down tarps for the whole path that we went in and out of the cave so as not to tear up the, the subsurface. One of the biggest concerns that we have with working in caves today is white nose syndrome. There's a, a fungus that is affecting bat populations all over North America. And it's believed that one of the ways that that fungus gets transmitted is by people going into one cave where the fungus is present and then not cleaning their gear and going into another cave and introducing it into that cave. So one of the things that almost anybody who's concerned about caves is dealing with today is trying to make sure that your gear is cleaned as you go from cave to cave and not be part of, of transmitting the, the white nose fungus that's impacting these bat populations. 
So how do fossils get in, into caves? There's a number of mechanisms. Owls are a tremendous resource for us. A lot of the cave sites that I've worked on are probably formed in large part uh, through the activities of owls. So all of you, I assume, are familiar with owls at some level. They go out, they pick up prey items, they tend to eat their prey relatively whole, so they don't tear it up. Uh, when they regurgitate their pellets, the bones that are in those pellets tend to be pretty complete. And one of the sites that I worked on in Arizona was almost exclusively produced by great horned owls regurgitating pellets. And it was just filled with tons and tons of bone. Pack rats, I've already mentioned, are amazing collectors all over Western North America, including here in, in Alberta. And then in some instances, you actually have animals that are living in caves. This is a, a scimitar cat from Friesenhan Cave in southern Texas, or central Texas. Uh, there's a cave, there, the cave there preserved remains of, of these cats as well as prey items. So there are big cats, there are little cats, and there are baby mammoths preserved in this cave. And the baby mammoths were probably coming into the cave as prey items that mom was bringing home for her babies. So there are animals that actually are utilizing caves as, as permanent shelter. In a lot of cases, <clears throat> excuse me, in a lot of cases, the areas that I'm most interested in as a researcher are near the entrance. And it's been, uh, it's been fun working with the caving community because when you go and you talk to cavers and you say, hey, I'm interested in, in caves and fossils coming out of caves, Immediately, they're excited about taking you two miles into the cave, you know, so you can see the whole thing. When in reality, the stuff that I'm most interested in is typically going to be near the, the entrance or near an old entrance, because most animals aren't going two miles into the, into the cave. When I talk about caves, uh, I use the term relatively loosely. So a cave in the sense that I'm referring to them can be something as simple as a big open rock shelter. Uh, and this is an area that was a, a roost for great horned owls. Great horned owls would just roost up on these sediments and this talus slope was just filled with bones from the pellets that they regurgitated. Uh, there are more proper caves that we work on. This is Cathedral Cave in Nevada, and I'm going to show you some more pictures of this particular site. There's a little bit of crawling involved in that one. And then you have sites like Persistence Cave in South Dakota, where you have to sort of Tetris yourself through the passageways to, to fit properly. One of the most recent sites that I've been working on is a site in South Dakota called Parker's Pit. Uh, this is the opening. You can see the opening down below Mark there. This is one where you actually put on a harness and these volunteers from the Denver Museum of Science and Nature have done a great job of rigging up a winch. So you just attach yourself to the winch, you get lowered in and do your work and then at the end of the day, they winch you back out. So. When we go to caves, as with any any research project, any field research project, the first question that we're really asking when we go to these caves is, is there anything there? And if there is, how old is it? So a lot of the sites that I'm gonna talk about today, when we first went to them, we went with the idea that we're trying to find out what's there and figure out what type of interesting questions that we can ask. But at a basic level, the, information, the starting information that we're looking for is, does the cave preserve fossils? And if it does, how old are those fossils? So I'm gonna use three case examples to talk about some of the different work. Basically, I'm gonna take you on a, a tour of three different cave sites in Western North America that we've worked in in the past or are currently working in. The first is Cathedral Cave in Nevada. This is the site where I did my dissertation work. I don't know if any of you have been to Great Basin National Park in Nevada, but Cathedral Cave is located just north of Great Basin National Park, uh, just north of the town of Baker, right on the Utah border. It's not a bad hike up to the cave. It's uh, got a, a nice prominent entrance. And this site was of interest because of some of the work that had been done at it previously. 
Now, one of the things that I specialize in, I focus on arvicoline rodents. So arvicoline rodents are voles, lemmings, and muskrats. They're a particular group of rodents. And this was the site that really got me interested in this group of animals. So arvicoline rodents are, are known from the Miocene to the recent. They tend to have evolved fairly rapidly. So their teeth have evolved fairly rapidly. And we've got pretty good knowledge of the chronological distribution of those different forms. So the teeth from these voles tend to be good chronological markers. They help us tell time, at least in the Miocene to, to recent. And this site was, Cathedral Cave was kind of interesting because we were getting mixed signals based on the type of teeth that we were finding and the actual radioisotopic work that was done. So the pink bar over here shows an age estimate based on uranium series dating. And uranium series dating is much like radiocarbon dating, it's based on the half-life of certain isotopes. And we can look at that half-life and figure out how old a particular rock deposit is. And at this site, the uranium series dating suggested that the fossils were somewhere between 15 and 25,000 years old. So very latest Pleistocene in age. That was very surprising to my colleague Chris Bell, who looked at the arvicoline rodents originally and found taxa that only persisted until about 750,000 years ago. So there was a huge discrepancy in what the rodent fossils were telling us about the age of the deposit and what the uranium series dates were telling us about the age of the deposit. So my work at this site was intended to go back and sort of resolve that chronological conundrum to figure out, okay, is this site actually 750,000 years old or is it closer to 15 or 20,000 years old? Or perhaps it's neither of those things. So in 2003, which seems like a long time ago right now, um, we went out and we conducted new excavation at this site. We excavated sediments in five centimeter intervals where we saw natural stratigraphy. We tried to excavate by that natural st stratigraphy. We looked for more fossils of these voles, lemmings, and muskrats. And I was hoping to find, in association with those fossils, material that we could radioisotopically date. And then we did some paleomagnetic work on the sediments as well. The excavation took place in room two. So this is, cathedral, this is the entirety of Cathedral Cave. So you see it's not a huge cave. It's a really, relatively restricted area with three main rooms. It's a nice cave in the sense that it's not a tight crawl. There's a couple of areas where you have to crawl through, but I can stand up in the cave. So it's an easy cave to work in, in that sense. And some of the earlier work that my colleague Chris Bell had done uh, was in the same area of room two. So we decided, well, let's, let's excavate in the same region, but we'll try to be a bit more careful about the levels. We'll take finer levels down. And so we worked in that same area. One of the challenges that we faced is there was a big area of disturbance in the cave. So I didn't draw lines there, but this represents that area of the cave. Um, when Chris had done his thesis work back in the early 90s, they had backfilled the site and they'd put a tarp in there to, to protect it. And over time, somebody had come in and just yanked that tarp out. So we had to essentially move a bit further to the east than we were planning. And the total area that we excavated was roughly this, this section. And then this is the site that we recovered those 30,000 fossils from. So we found lots of new taxonomic records. This is a little piece of an extinct mountain goat horn core, which was a new find for that cave. There's a big piece of a kitty paw right there. Uh, of those 30,000 fossils, I probably personally looked at and identified between five and 7,000 of them. And there, it's a project that I'm still working on in, in bits and pieces. So this is the kind of, this is one of these things about cave deposits. You can go and you can excavate a cave deposit and you've got something that you can work on for the rest of your career, depending on which taxonomic groups that you're interested in. 
We did find unmixed deposits, or at least areas where no mixing occurred. This little section uh, was relatively cemented. It was indurated, so I think at the very least, the sediments below that section and above that section were not mixed with each other, which was a good thing. And we did find flow stones at the base of that excavation that allowed us to do some of that uranium series dating. I mentioned that we, we found a lot of the fossils that I was interested in, and I haven't shown any vole teeth yet, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a bit about those right now. This is a typical vole tooth. I think they're kind of cute. They look kind of like little Christmas trees. There's little alternating triangles of enamel. You'll have some cementum sandwiched in between some of those triangles. Uh, we count the triangles from front to back. They have a posterior loop. And typically it's the lower first molar that we're interested in. That's the, that's the tooth that tends to mo show the most evolutionary change through time. So really when we're looking for, for vole teeth in these cave deposits, it's the lower first molar that we're looking for. The types of characters that we use to identify those teeth vary. We look at the teeth to see if they're rooted or unrooted. We look at the number of triangles on the tooth, the symmetry of the triangles. You'll see that the symmetry is very different here than here. The presence or absence of cementum is a character that we look at. And we look at the confluence of the triangles, how relatively open or closed are each of those triangles relative to one another. So those are the types of things that we look for with respect to identifying these particular types of critters. One of the things that we found at this site, which was exciting, was uh, muskrat teeth. Uh, it had not been reported before. We only found two lower first molars, but chronologically, uh, that was a potentially significant find for us. This is the one graph that I have today. I don't have tons of graphs for you, so this is the only one that I'm gonna show you. But muskrats show a general evolutionary trend through time where the teeth get longer and wider. So by taking length and width measurements on those teeth, we can kind of place them in that relative sequence. And what we found is that the teeth plotted right over here. The pink X's represent a fauna, a dated fauna from Kansas called the Cudahy fauna that dates to about 670,000 years ago. The fact that these teeth plotted to the right of the Cudahy fauna suggested that they were from a younger fauna. So the hypothesis that, that this deposit was 750,000 years old was challenged a bit by the, by the size of these teeth. We were also able to do uranium series dating on flowstones that underlay the excavation. And what we found is that the, the flow stones indicated a significantly younger age for the deposit. It wasn't 750,000 years old, but it also was not latest Pleistocene. It appears now that the, the maximum age for the deposit is roughly 140, 150,000 years old. And the paleomagnetic work that we did was, also, was consistent with that interpretation. Now, the, the interesting thing about that is that it resulted in range extensions, age range extensions for several taxa. So Alophiomys pliocenicus, Microtus paraparaeus, Phenacomys grichii, and Microtus medensis. We extended the known range for all of those taxa at this site. Uh, it was previously thought that they, they had become extirpated or gone extinct much earlier. The interesting thing about that is I think it's probably telling us something about high elevations. A lot of the, a lot of the chronological interpretations that have been made using vole teeth have been based out on the Great Plains of Central North America. And we didn't really have a good understanding of what was going on in mountainous regions. And I think probably what's happening is you have microenvironments in those mountainous regions that are allowing certain taxa to persist for long periods of time. So essentially, those mountains are acting as refugia for some of these taxa during, during times of extreme climate change. And that is something that has been hinted at in other places like the Black Hills of South Dakota. So when I moved 
up here to Alberta, one of the things I was most interested in was starting to look at cave faunas in the Canadian Rockies to see if we could find material of comparable age and to continue to try to test that idea. So I arrived here in 2008, and one of the first things I did, I wrote to the Alberta Speleological Society, and I said, this is who I am, this is what I'm interested in. I'm looking for, for bones in caves. And I, a colleague from Parks Canada called me and said, I've got a couple of sites to show you in Jasper. So we went out and since that time, we've been exploring and dating material from several cave sites in Jasper National Park. Uh, the first site that I'm gonna talk about today is this cave, cave number one. Uh, one of the things, oh, one of the things that I forgot to point out is that this area of Alberta hasn't really been looked at too much in terms of looking for caves and fossils. My predecessor at the museum, Jim Burns, had done some work down in the Crow's Nest Pass area and the Canmore area, looking at a couple of sites down there, but sites in Jasper hadn't been looked at. So this was, this was kind of new, new territory. And one of the questions that, that I was interested in trying to get at with the material that we were collecting from caves in Jasper was trying to understand how life returns to a highly disturbed landscape. From about 22,000 years ago to about 12,000 years ago, the province of Alberta was completely covered by ice. There was nothing, nothing living here. There is no bigger ecosystem disturbance than that, than putting ice across the province. So there's no vegetation, no plants. One of the things that I think Alberta actually serves as a nice natural laboratory for is asking questions about how life responds to major ecosystem disturbances. And my idea was that some of the caves in Jasper might be able to give us some idea about when life returns to Alberta and how that pattern plays out. Uh, once the ice recedes, do animals you know, sort of pop their heads up and say, hey, Alberta's available again, let's all go back. Or do animals, oops, do animals come back to the province individualistically? That's a pattern that we're trying to, to tweak out with some of the work that we're doing. And I'm particularly interested in how that pattern plays out at higher elevations. This is a profile of the first cave that we went to. It's a very, ver or, or, this, sorry, not a, yeah, it's a cross-section, sorry. Profile cross-section. It's about a 105-foot rappel to get down into the cave. Uh, the rappelling part, I will tell you, is a lot of fun. The coming back out part is not so much fun at this particular site. Uh, there's ice that hangs down, so you see this area called the icicle. You have to kind of, you slide down this ice and there's this tricky lip that you have to come over. It's much trickier going back up, but it is kind of fun kind of fun going down. And it was really my first introduction into field work here in Alberta. So I'm going to take a little detour. Um, one of the things that happened on this first trip, uh, I was not even aware of until weeks later. Uh, Parks Canada had a motion activated camera set up to monitor what was happening at the site, who was going in and out of the site. So you'll see there's a date, there's a timestamp, uh, that's my colleague Greg. That's me clinging to the tree for dear life. It had been a long time since I'd done vertical work, so I was actually a little bit nervous about getting on rope and descending into the, into the unknown. Uh, so take a look at the timestamp, 11.11. Greg went in first. I probably dropped into the cave at about 12.30 or so. So 12.07, there's Mr. Black Bear sniffing the spot where my sweaty hand had been, had been clinging. He has a look down into the entrance. The first work that we were doing there was right around, was right below, so I'm sure he could hear us in there. Has another sniff, smiles for the camera, <laughs> and that's me coming out several hours later. So I had no idea that this had happened until three or four weeks later when my colleague from Parks Canada sent me an email that said, hey, we downloaded the photos from the day that we were at the cave. Take a look at what happened. And I think I spent a whole afternoon sitting in my office going back and forth through those photos. Uh, I sent them to my wife and she was much less enthusiastic about them than I was. So 
So that was my introduction to, to field work in caves in Alberta. Uh, this is actually inside the cave uh, where we found a, a big section of soft sediments that was filled with bone and mollusk shells, vegetation, and charcoal. And the cavers who had been exploring this cave had done me a, a great favor because they'd actually cut through some of these sediments looking for additional passageways. And by doing that, they actually exposed one of these faces. And I could see that there was bone in it. I could see that there was charcoal in it that we could get radiocarbon dates on. So as someone who's looking for, for fossils in, in caves, this is the, the perfect type of setting. This is, this is the kind of thing that we look for. Uh, unfortunately, the sediments in this particular site are coming in at a, a very steep angle. So we didn't do a big excavation because we would have been cross-cutting several layers of sediment. So we restricted the work that we did to a, a, a pretty simple 10 centimeter profile. But we found lots of material. Uh, so each one of those little vials has a, a fossil specimen in it or a specimen in it, a couple of mustelid skulls, so uh, weasel skulls, shrew jaw, gastropod. So it was, a, it was a neat site in that sense. It was a little bit younger than I was hoping for. The material from the site dated between 6,000 years old and 2,000 years old. So it's telling us something about what was going on in, in Jasper in the latest Quaternary, but doesn't really get at the question of, of life returning to Alberta, or at least I don't think it, it, it really answers that. The next site that I'm going to take you to in Jasper is cave number three, and it's a much more high elevation site than that first one. Uh, it's up above tree line. The entrance to the cave is right over there. That's a view from the, from the cave entrance. You can see our tents down there and then looking off down into the, the snaring river valley. So it's a, it's a beautiful setting. And it's actually a, a, a tremendous cave. It's the first time I've been in a cave with huge ice deposits in it. So this is a big sheet of ice. And you'll see some little white specks on there. There are actually gypsum crystals precipitating out on the ice. Don't ask me how that works. I don't understand that. But, but it's, it's an amazing thing to, to stand and look at. And the, this whole section of the cave is filled with pack rat poop. So that's also something that when we go into caves, if we see evidence of pack rats, there's a good chance that we're, go we're going to find bones there. Unfortunately, at this, at this particular site, the, the amount of poop outnumbers the number of bones by a, a huge number. There's a, just an ungodly amount of pack rat dung in there. Um, we, collected, we did collect some of it, and I collected some material from some of the more cemented pack rat poop, so one of these, one of these middens. And we got a radiocarbon date that dated to about 9,600 years ago. Uh, so that, I think, is telling us something about when life is starting to really reoccupy some of these higher elevations in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. I think that's a, at least a, a starting indicator of that. We need to find some more sites that have some of this older material. But I would, I would say, based on this, we've got pretty good evidence that wood rats are starting to reoccupy those high elevations by about 9,600 years ago after the ice sheets have retreated. Now, one of the things, as I was putting this talk together, I thought, you know, I need to go back through and see how many dates that we've actually done on some of these cave sites. And much to my surprise, we've done more over the last 10 years than, than I remembered. And there's kind of an interesting pattern emerging. So these are all dates that I've run from cave sites in Jasper National Park, ranging from 9,600 years before present all the way up to modern. In southern Alberta, uh, my predecessor, Jim, Jim Burns, found some cave deposits that have pre-last glacial maximum deposits. So some deposits that predate the last major glacial advance in Alberta. And one of the things that I, I think is quite interesting is that we haven't found those. We haven't found anything that dates to that time period in the caves in Jasper. And I think, I think what that may be telling us is something about those cave systems and how in the ge geological history of those cave systems. The caves in the Jasper area tend to be very vertical. There's a lot of ice in them. 
And I think that some of those caves probably flushed over time. So as, as the ice sheets that were present in the mountains started to melt, it probably flushed a lot of deposits out of those caves. So what we're seeing is only material that was deposited after that event took place. Whereas some of the caves in the, the southern part of the Canadian Rocky Mountains are preserving older deposits. So it may be something, it may be telling us something about the, the hydrodynamics of those cave systems in different parts of the province. And it's not, it's not really a, a question or an issue that I intended to address with this research, but it's something that, that the radiocarbon dates seem to be indicating, which is kind of interesting. So what's next for us in Alberta? Uh, last summer, I was able to go visit a site that some of you might be familiar with, uh, Moose Mountain Cave. Uh, Moose Mountain, I think, is a, a fairly prominent uh, collecting spot for paleontologists in Alberta, at least for invertebrate fossils. There's lots of interesting invertebrate fossils in the limestones. Uh, but it was a, it, it's a beautiful cave in terms of Ice Age paleontology, or it, it held promise because it's got a huge entrance, it overlooks a river valley. In many ways, it's an ideal setting for, for, for both animals and for people because it gives you a, a great view of your surrounding landscape. Unfo oh, I'm gonna go back. Unfortunately, uh, the interior part of the cave didn't hold a lot of promise. We crawled around the cave, didn't find much, but the entrance, we collected a few bits of bone from the surface in between some of these blocky limestones. And I thought, well, just for fun, let's see how old this is. I think, you know, probably a couple thousand years wouldn't surprise me. We ended up getting a radiocarbon date that, that was beyond radiocarbon. So the, the result was this is older than radiocarbon can, can accurately date which surprised the heck out of me. So one of the things that we're gonna do this summer is, is go back to this site and collect some more material and see, do some more dating and see if this site truly does preserve the remains of, of pre-glacial pre faunas, which would be quite interesting. Okay. Does anybody have questions? Okay. The question was, uh, with, the, with some of the first slides, we were wearing uh, masks or respirators. And why were, we, why were we wearing those? In part, it's just because of the dust. Um, yeah, certainly hantavirus is, is, a, is a concern in parts of the arid southwest. But, but in a lot of those caves, it's so dry and dusty, especially the ones like the Rampart Cave, where the, the fire had taken place. You step in there and you can just see in your headlamp, you can see all of the fine particles starting to, to move around. So mainly you wear the masks for lung protection. All right, the last place I wanna take you is some of the most recent work that we've been doing and that's in caves in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And I'm, I'm excited about the work that we're doing here for a number of reasons. In part, I grew up in this area so I have a strong affinity to it. But I also think that it serves as a potential analog for certain places in Alberta, especially places like the Cypress Hills, which represent topographically high spots among, among relatively low-lying areas surrounding them. So the, the Black Hills have often been called an island in the plains, and that's because they're a topographic high in the sea that is the, the Great Plains. One of the one of the interesting things about this area is that it was never glaciated. So it's also giving us a different perspective on how animals responded during glacial times. Whereas Alberta was covered by ice, uh, the, the Black Hills were not. So it's giving us a slightly different perspective on how animals responded to climate change during the, during the Ice Age. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Mount Rushmore is in the Black Hills. So uh, that's usually a good reference point for most people. One of, the, one of the interesting things about the Black Hills is the modern biota there contains elements from multiple directions. There are clearly influences from the north, from the east, and from the west, where you have animals that are typically, typically associated with western faunas that inhabit the Black Hills, 
you have animals that are typically associated with more eastern faunas that in, inhabit the Black Hills. So it's really unique biologically compared to the surrounding area. And one of the questions that, that we're trying to chase is how that came to be. How did that pattern play out in, in time and space? And caves are one of the places where we can address that. So one of the sites that we're working at is located in Wind Cave National Park. It's in the Southern Black Hills, and it's a site that was found many years ago by the Park Service, but they, they kind of, they, they kept it under wraps for a bit. Uh, they definitely don't want people going in there because it is a rattlesnake hibernaculum. So the last, I know the last thing that I wanna do is, is crawl into a cave and see myself looking at a rattlesnake. That does not sound like fun. Um, uh, for, those, I, for those of you that don't know, hibernacula are places where during the winter, snakes will go and congregate. We have them in Alberta. Garter snakes, there are garter snakes hibernacula in Alberta. I think there was, last year, I think there was a report of one in somebody's basement in Saskatchewan where snakes kept coming through because the, there was a hibernaculum right next to their, their basement. Um, I'd worry less about garter snakes and more about rattlesnakes. But uh, This is the entrance to the cave. You'll see lots of uh, poison ivy sitting around the entrance. Uh, much like Rampart Cave, uh, the Park Service has put a gate over, over this site. Uh, it allows the snakes to t continue to go in and out, but it deters people from, from going in and out without permission. The cave itself, so far, is, is fairly, it looks fairly simple. Uh, you drop in, and then it takes off to two passageways. And I'm sorry, I don't have a good map of this cave. This is my crude field notebook drawing. So uh, it's got two small passageways. The Park Service is most interested in understanding whether this cave connects to the larger wind cave system or represents a unique cave. So they're interested in understanding the limits of the cave. And as part of the work that they're doing there, they are clearing out sediments. And as they've been doing that, they have been uncovering Ice Age fossils. So we're taking some of that material, processing that material, and working on figuring out what's preserved in this particular site. This shows you one of the passageways. That's actually not a great photo. This is a better one. This is when you do that little drop in and you start to go into the cave, that's how much room you have. That's my foot for scale. So that tells you how much clearance there actually is in that cave. Uh, this is not my type of cave. I am fairly tall and I'm flexible like an icicle. So. I, I worry about going into places like this only for the reason that I'm not sure that I can turn around and get back out. Uh, that's me pondering whether I'm going to actually crawl in or let somebody else do that. And that is the small graduate student that we sent in instead of, uh, instead of me. Um, so Sharon is now at the MAMA site in Hot Springs, South Dakota, and she's a, she's a collaborator on this, on this project. But she was, a, she was a good sport. She went in and did most of the digging at this site. Um, that's me looking way too happy in the entrance. We did a, initially, we did a, a bit of excavation uh, right in that drop-in area. Uh, we collected some samples for, for pollen analysis. But the most interesting stuff was coming in from the, the cave itself. Uh, that is my colleague, Jim Mead, who is heading this particular project up. Uh, he sort of sat in the middle, and we would pa pass this roasting pan back and forth with a rope. So it would go into Sharon, she'd excavate a little bit, it would come to Jim, I would pull it out, we dump it into a bag and label where it came from. So this one, this excavation was truly a, a, a team effort. Uh, the Park Service is also pulling lots of material out of there. So that pile on the tarp is all material that is just filled with Ice Age fossils that the Park Service has pulled out. So we're taking all of that material and we're screen washing it. So we typically with cave sediments, you go in, you excavate, and then you bring the sediments out and you wash it through a series of nested screens. And then you spend hours and hours sitting at a microscope pulling all the little fossils off of those screens. Uh, we had a screen wash station set up at this site, so some horse troughs where we're running material through. 
we had bison come in to visit every day. So it was a pretty, in that sense, it was a pretty nice, pretty nice place to work. Uh, this is a, a Park Service member uh, helping pass bags from the, from the bottom of the cave. One of the interesting things at this site was uh, this, little, this little guy. He had a nest in one of those passageways, and he was not happy that we were working in the cave. So he came out, and I, I swear it was half hour, 45 minutes, just sat there and chirped at us. And he actually, when he first came roaring out of there, he came right up Rod's leg. Came right up his leg, went, bounced, and then proceeded to sit on the, the down stump and chirp at us for about 45 minutes. He was also not very happy that we were there. So one of the things we found out is don't leave equipment there. So Jacqueline Gill from the University of Maine had her nice uh, transect tape, and it got left at the cave. Uh, Mr. Squirrel proceeded to pull that out and chew 10 centimeter strips off of the entire thing. So her, her you know, I don't know, uh, 20 meter transect became a series of 10 centimeter transect strips. Uh, as I said, most of the work that we do, all these sites, we do screen washing at. I mean, that's the, that is really the primary way that we recover fossils from this site, is to bring the material back. In a lot of these sites, there's so much clay that you can't, you, you don't see the fossils when you're actually excavating. You really only see them when you start to do the, the screen washing. Dry them out, and then you start to see stuff like that, which is a, a piece of a little carnivore maxilla. At this particular site, we are getting lots of interesting material. Uh, we found pica, or pica, as it's sometimes pronounced up here. Uh, they no longer occur in the Black Hills today. We found pieces of black bear. Black bear no longer occur in the Black Hills, but that's more of a, uh, more of a historic extirpation. Uh, from my point of view, the interesting stuff is, of course, the voles, and we are finding lots of vole remains. So there's a piece of a muskrat tooth right there. That is a microtus tooth, a, a, a meadow vole, or actually that one's a prairie vole, sorry. And we're also finding uh, extirpated forms of, of voles, lemmings, and, and muskrats at this site. This is a a partial lower jaw from a sagebrush vole. Today, sagebrush voles occur throughout Western North America, but they don't quite get into the Black Hills. And I'd previously dated sagebrush voles from a, a different site in the Black Hills and got a date of about 40,000 years. At this site, we dated, we directly dated one of these sagebrush vole jaws and it came back at about 39,000 years old. So one of the things that we're, we're starting to see, we're starting to see some patterning with the radiocarbon dates and the material that we're pulling from these sites. We just need to get more dates at this point. This is a heather vole. Heather voles today occur to the north or to the west, but no longer occur in the Black Hills. And this is a bog lemming, which today occurs to the east, but no longer occurs in the Black Hills. So the next steps for this particular project are to start to get a series of direct dates on a lot of those taxa. One of the things that I'm interested in, yes, we're finding them all in the same site, but I'm interested in finding out whether or not they were actually all there at the same time. When do they arrive? When do they become extirpated? How does that pattern play out? And what does it tell us about the, the formation of the modern biota? Uh, in addition to that, there is another new site that we're, that we're involved in, which is a, a site close to the one that I showed you from Wind Cave. This is actually outside the park. This is a site that I, I went to last summer. It's a drop-in cave. Uh, I put this photo here. Uh, my colleague, Eric Grimm, took a core in the sediment floor of the cave that went down 12, 12 feet, and there is bone throughout that core. So there is a huge amount of sediment. And looking at the stratigraphy that we can see, it looks like it may be a continuous sequence of sediment. So this particular site, I think, actually has the potential to be one of the most significant sites on, in the northern Great Plains. It may represent a fairly continuous record through the, the very latter portions of the Pleistocene. 
And the plan is to be down there for a couple of weeks this field season doing more excavation at this site. So I don't have much to tell you about this site right at this moment, but I think it's going to produce a lot of inf interesting information about animals in, at high elevations during the, the last ice age. And with that, I, I love this Farsight cartoon, so I'm going to leave it at that, and I'll be glad to take any questions that you guys might have.